Hi, I'm Charlie Roy and I'm the author of The Broken Pain, which is out now with Leamington Books. I'd like to thank Publishing Scotland for inviting me to be part of Book Week Scotland 2021 in their new author showcase. They've asked me to read an excerpt from my book and I'm going to start with this chapter. The timeline in the story moves around a great deal and in this case, this particular chapter takes place in 1983. The light from the big street window in the waiting room at the funeral directors filtered through, past large display boards advertising their services to passers-by. The carpet was striped grey, beige and black. The wallpaper had a coral sheen to the brown geometric pattern. The effect of the contrast with the pale green motif on the chairs was making my eyes swim. The scent from an immense bouquet of lilies cloyed at the back of my throat. I was clutching a bag of clothes for my little brother Nicky. A pair of smart jeans, a jumper, a shirt. I brought socks, shoes and pants too. The sympathetic lady on the phone had not mentioned those, but it seemed wrong to send him off without them. I had tried to find his Star Wars t-shirt, only to remember he had outgrown it years before. The funeral parlour was on the route to the Odeon Cinema, which is why I thought of the t-shirt. We only went there once altogether, to see The Return of the Jedi. Nicky had wanted to go on the Clockwork Orange, Glasgow's underground light rail service. It wouldn't have made sense to walk, walk down from Buchanan Street, so we got the bus. George promised him that they would, all, they would go all the way round the circular together another time. I don't know if they ever did. Waiting outside under the enormous marquee, George told us that both the Beatles and the Rolling Stones had played there in the 1960s. Mick said all he remembered from the 60s were endless nappies. Nicky was not listening. He was bouncing on his toes, banging on about Boba Fett and something called a Sarlacc. I rolled my eyes. Star Wars had been everywhere. The actors were on Blue Peter. The school playground was a trading hub of cards. There was a column in Just Seventeen on the do's and don'ts of dating Mark Hamill, whether he was a better brother or boyfriend. We hadn't seen the first two films, but Nicky knew everything about the stories. He would draw land speeders and stormtroopers to swap for the comics with his friends. His pictures were so good that even the older kids sought him out. He was working on a large hand-drawn version of the film poster, which he hoped to swap for an at-at from the Jolly Giant. I didn't think anyone would go for that deal, but Nicky had a way of charming people into giving him what he wanted. That was why we were all there. Nana, George, Mick, Nicky and I, even though Bugs was the only one interested in the space films. We were inside and he was yammering about the at-at when Nana strode across the foyer brandishing the tickets. Nicky squealed and did a victory dance in front ahead of everyone, pulling his Star Wars t-shirt over his head and drumming on his tummy. There had been queues around the block for weeks, so I had warned him that we might not get in at all. He knew well enough this might be his only chance. Mick laughed. He half joined in before stretching his arms out like a circus master and took a bow. The great Nicky, ladies and gents, world famous clown. There was a thin, indulgent applause. Folding back, Mick started up a conversation with another father in front of us. He had a gift for banter. I retreated behind George's robust frame. I hated when Dad was silly and flamboyant like this. It was a warning sign. Boys, eh? Love to be the centre of attention, don't they? By the time the line started to move, Nicky was like a dog straining at a lead. We walked countless steps until we found our seats in the cavernous auditorium. The room was packed with over a thousand people. I hoped I would not need the toilet as it would be impossible to find my way back through the steep bank of seats. I don't remember the film. Science fiction was never of great interest to me. I had not got on with Jules Verne when the librarian had suggested his books. I liked Little Women and The Secret Garden. It was nice to all be together for a change. Mick, I mean Dad, rarely did anything fun with us. Nana sometimes took us to the big park in the summer. Of course, George always came too. Everyone assumed that he was our grandfather, though he didn't live with Nana. No one expected older folk to be unconventional in that way. There were mornings when I could not understand how George was at Nana's house quite so early. The curtains drew across the wee stage at the front for the intermission. Mick and George got up, and I sat there staring at the ceiling while Nana and Nicky chatted about the space barge, where the Boba Fett had survived. I didn't want to barge in on their chat. I wondered if, Na if Ange, my mother, would have liked it, or if she was like me. I couldn't imagine her going to see the silly stuff without having to take a young boy. 
I pulled my mind back from the thought she might have another boy by now. Nana said she thought Leia's gold bikini would suit her, and we both groaned loudly. I didn't know what you wanted, so I got a bit of everything. Scoot over, Tam. George came back from the concessions with so much they'd given him a box to carry it in. There were sodas, popcorn, sweets, two tubs of vanilla and strawberry ice cream, and two chalk ices. He handed them out just before the curtains closed again, and he put the box down on our fifth seat. Mick didn't come back for the second half. None of us mentioned it. So the story of the broken pain is one that follows Tam, who is a young woman who makes a tragic discovery at the start of the story. And she needs to piece together her family history in order to move on from this. It really focuses on the idea of memory and secrets within families and how these things might shape us, how our memories of ourselves can shape us or we can shape them and that it's not necessarily reliable. It is also about healing and finding uh, hope in and amongst the debris of what a broken family might look like. The reason I wanted to write about this um, stems from a couple of different places. So first of all, um, I'm someone who's always written. I've always enjoyed writing. And when I was at school, I used to pass notes to friends that were stories rather than the usual kind of content of a school note. Um, and I carried on doing it for years. Um, and that eventually became short stories, which I like to write, a lot of poetry, which I'm probably better known for. Um, and when I had the opportunity to sit down and write a novel, the, the first time around, when I was in my 20s, I'd started on a, on a very different line, um, but I didn't feel that story was taking me anywhere. However, this character that would become Tam uh, became of great interest to me, and I found myself uh, focusing a lot on her. And it was around this time that I was getting uh, more involved with um, things going on in the spoken word scene, and I became particularly interested in mental health, women's mental health, um, the impact of that on families, but also the impact of maybe society's expectations and what the laws historically would have allowed, the choices that women might have been allowed to make and how that would impact on the uh, wider family life. So I became interested in that and that all coalesced into this story uh, of Tam. I suppose in some ways you could say that is what inspires my writing. Um, however, I think it's wider than that. I'm someone who, um, as I say, I write every day. I, I find that if I don't write, um, I tend to get a bit cranky. Um, my self-regulation is not as good. And I find inspiration in most things every day. And what's interesting is that sometimes a small thing that might have inspired me might then connect back in a surprising way to whatever I'm working on. I've noticed I tend to write um, seasonally, so I often write poetry in the spring and I fold into the long form come the autumn. Um, but often the sparks are similar. I, I enjoy going out walking with my dog. Um, and so quite often ideas will come to me while I'm doing that. Um, but I do find that it is important to me to write about mental health, about healing, um, not in a sort of easy way, uh, but the the struggles that one might go through um, and it's just something that I'm driven to write about. My next project which I've started on is again about how we perceive ourselves. It comes a lot to this next one whereas The Broken Pain, uh, the current novel, um, focuses on things that might have happened in childhood and their effects then on someone's perception of themselves and on the family. This next one uh, will work largely around teenage years and the connections we form when we are teenagers and how those then might impact on us and also looking at mental health uh, from that point of view and um, moving backwards and forwards to, to those um, ideas and how we view ourselves um, in relation to the world. Um, so I suppose that's really all about what I'm doing and, and my work. my favourite reads of this year, um, or in fact singular, however it's really hard. First of all, I've read a great deal of books and some absolutely fantastic work. Um, I've really enjoyed 
an enormous amount of uh, authors this year. But the ones that stand stand out now looking back, I would say uh, I'd like to mention one which um, is called Stay Mad Sweetheart by Helene Kist, um, which is not a genre I'd usually read, but it was recommended to me. Um, it's set in Edinburgh and it's a thriller, um, really good page turner. And it's not, not something I'd normally go for, but it's, it's kind of stayed with me. I, I enjoyed that. Um, then I think the next one that I'd probably pick out would be The Mercies by Kieran Millwood Hargrave, um, which surprised me um, in that it, it deals with relationships between women, um, but I felt in quite an interesting and novel way and explored various aspects of friendships and sisterhood, but also in the face of quite bleak circumstances. Um, and I know I was meant to only recommend one, so if I have to choose one, uh, I'm going with The Island of Sea Women by Lisa C, which was a real eye-opener because it had a, dealt with a great deal of history and a particular community um, in Korea at the time of the Second World War. And it was absolutely fascinating, historically speaking, as well as being beautifully written. The characterization is superb. Uh, and in fact, I'm looking forward to reading another of her books soon because it really... I feel I feel as though I'd, I'd met these people and and really understood their lives. They felt very real, and um, I absolutely adored it. Um, so that's really everything. So again, I am Charlie Roy. I wrote the broken pane, and thank you to Publishing Scotland and Book Week Scotland. Hello, my name is Kirsty Wishart. I'm author of The Knitting Station, which was published earlier this year by Rhymer Books, and I'm going to read you the opening pages of it. The night before the voyage to Tharn, in her cold Aberdeen B&B &B bed, Hannah dozed and a head filled with mushroom clouds. Dozens of them blossomed with a slow and terrible grace over a plateau, the sky turning a virulent red, atomic orange. The terror of the sight faded as those large fluffy clouds shrank and sank, grew sh four short hooved legs apiece. Black sheep's heads thrust out one end with piercing eyes a radioactive yellow, while stubby white tails wagged at the other. Their joyful baas crescendoed as they neared the curiously unscorched grass and on landing they gambled, leapt over the ineffective fences. Hannah awoke with a start, scarcely knew whether to laugh or cry. She'd half a mind to run to Dr Fredrickson's room and tell him what harm his awful plan had already inflicted on her damaged subconscious. Attempted to keep calm, she listened to the restless breath of her roommate Maisie, one of the three other patients brought along as part of this mad experiment. Maisie twittered and mumbled, but at least she was asleep and Hannah didn't want to wake her for the sake of some sheep-infested nightmare. Clutching her candlewick blanket, she focused on the solidity of her narrow bed in contrast to the watery conditions to be faced tomorrow. What had she been thinking? She cursed the doctor's charm, the way she'd been swept along by his enthusiasm for a new radical treatment involving knitting therapy, portraying the group as experimental pioneers advancing medical history. The prospect of getting away from the confines of the Institute had also been attractive, and she got into the way of thinking of it as a holiday, albeit one with an insistence on handicrafts being undertaken. But now, with the world on the brink of nuclear disaster, Kennedy a hair's breadth away from war on Russia, being whisked away from the civilised environs of Edinburgh, well, the institute on the outskirts, to an island so small it wanted not a speck on maps of the North Sea seemed ridiculous. Especially it should be spending two months in a place with a population of sheep outnumbered humans five to one, and to do what? Knit. Knitting. This was how she was expected to spend her time. Not writing to MPs, the newspapers, protesting, agitating. No. Instead, she would be improving her skills at casting off. Falling asleep against a pillow as comfy as a tea tray, her sobs sounded bleak-like. 
The next day, stepping up the threshold of the low-ceilinged passenger cabin of a tiny thorn-bound ferry, Hannah gripped Mises's arm at the sight confronting her. Because among the wooden benches were sheep. A small herd dotted about, the sheer wrongness of them in an enclosed space surrounded by sea making it difficult to count. That, and it felt cheeky to do so, as this particular breed was a good day, deal less cheery than the fluffy flock of last night. They regarded the new arrivals in unnerving silence, yellow eyes filled with bored contempt, a uh, who let you aboard disdain. Worried this was a panic-induced hallucination, Hannah whispered, Maisie, you were sheep. They are there, aren't they? If this was some sort of woolly vision, Hannah had to admit her subconscious had outdone itself by including olfactory effects, the smell of a barn enveloping them. Not that she'd ever visited a barn, but this would surely be the aroma tickling the back of her throat if she did. A thick woolly fog of damp fleece and hay, warm dung and a musky earthiness that should have been unpleasant, but wasn't. In fact, as she breathed in deeply, it proved a comfort, a distraction from the timbers shivering beneath her feet. On the far side of the cabin next to Alfie and Gordon sat the doctor and he waved them to the bench opposite. Gordon had hunched up his lankiness, hands tucked into his oxters, knees up to his ears. He appeared as cadaverous as death in a huff, although with more hair, the tonsure of black ringing his baldness slightly too long for anyone to mistake him for a monk. Even Alfie, the human spark plug, was subdued, eyes wide against his surroundings. His finger tugged at the collar of his shirt beneath his woolly jumper like a condemned man checking his noose. There were fewer outbursts than usual, though, only the occasional overboard escaping. Naturally, the doctor was content, and he bore the air of a sophisticated ship's captain in his Holmberg and grey astrakhan coat. His retained solidity, distinguished beard and wonderfully neat gold spectacles offered comfort. Dear ladies, please join us and do take care not to startle the livestock. So the knitting station is set in the early 1960s at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis and it's about a group of psychiatric patients who are taken to a remote Scottish island called Tharn, a place like Fair Isle which is famed for its knitwear and whilst there they're going to undergo a radical form of knitting therapy. The lead character who we just met, Hannah Richards, She's a former Bletchley Park codebreaker and she begins to suspect the place is about to be invaded by Russian agents. Um, but she can't be sure if this is actually happening or if it's her mind playing tricks with her. So what drew me to the story was it was originally inspired by a friend bringing into work some vintage knitting patterns from the 60s. And I was just fascinated by how the covers seemed to present scenes from a, a homely yet glamorous subculture. Um, they did seem to be stills from some forgotten strand of British movie making. And of course, people like Roger Moore and Twiggy made appearances in them. So for me, it was a natural jump to imagine the equivalent of something like Studio 54 on a Scottish island, run by the likes of the mysterious Madame Jean, um, which is where Hannah and her fellow patients end up. Well, years and years ago, I wrote a PhD which featured a chapter on John Buchan. And while I do like some aspects of his writing, like the narrative drive, I also really wanted to subvert that kind of thriller genre and like the idea of trying to combine the cosy knitting elements with the possible threat of armed military invasion. You can do some damage with a knitting needle after all. I wanted to pay homage to a particular kind of middle-aged woman that I think you don't tend to see too much of these days. There were plenty of them when I started in the civil service about 20 years ago, and they'd usually work as secretaries or school teachers, and they'd really be the ones holding together whatever institution they were working in. They'd be quite thrawn, quite fierce, a bit scary, and they'd usually be called something like Margaret or Hilda or Muriel. And as I say, you don't tend to see too many of them nowadays. I think they're quite underrepresented. And so as the acknowledgements of the book say, this one's for the grannies. All sorts of strands of pop culture, films and TV inspire my writing. But in this particular case, it was things like Mad Men and Endeavour. 
that play around with certain cultural associations and images we have with particular time periods, a kind of playful nostalgia, one that is aware of the political undercurrents that might not have been represented at the time. This particular novel, I was also inspired by the books that I read when I was wee, so things like Willard Price Adventure Stories or The Three Investigators. It's been described as Famous Five meets One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which I think is about right, and I describe it myself as Scooby-Doo on Too Much I Am Brew. I'd say my main inspiration, though, is pleasure, both for myself in writing it and for the reader, and being sure that I try to keep them entertained. So I have to squeeze in writing around a full-time job, so I have to keep myself engaged during the short amount of time that I'm able to devote to it. So it's important to me that I enjoy that time and I hope that communicates itself to the reader and that pleasure and being fully immersed in all the details and textures of a made up world. So what I'm currently working on could probably be best described as an urban fantasy set in Edinburgh and it's about a witch a hedge witch called Lizzie Bryce, who lives on a council estate and is murdered. It's, it's not a spoiler, by the way. It happens quite early on and you know who done it. Um, she's murdered by a local councillor who's trying to tap into the power of the green man to help sway planning applications and the like, which you do. And the story's about Lizzie's daughter, Gail, who's trying to get to the bottom of her mum's death and also accepting the fact that she might have inherited some of her mum's power and having to deal with the responsibility that comes along with that. It's also about Edinburgh becoming this strange and wonderful place with nature bursting through the cracks um, because the green man doesn't take too kindly to being used for political ends. One of my favourite books from 2021 is by a fellow rhymer writer called Graham Le Roney. It's called Fate Flowers. And in a way that's quite similar to The Knitting Station, it takes a genre like the thriller and gives it this surreal twist. It's about an underground anarchist group attempting to disrupt the Edinburgh tattoo in quite baroque fashion. It's like Line of Duty, is written by Don DeLillo, or Vigil, directed by Salvador Dali. And it's just a fantastic read, like nothing else you've come across unless you've been lucky enough to read Graham's other novels. So I'd just like to say thanks very much to Publishing Scotland for giving me the opportunity to appear in the showcase and see how much I'm looking forward to reading the other writers. So thank you. Hello, I'm J.A. Mensa, and I'm the writer of Castles from Cobwebs. It's my debut novel and it was published earlier this year by Saraband. The novel explores the story of Imani, a young woman who is left as a baby on an island off the northeast coast. She's found by a nun and raised in a convent. She's black and the only person of colour on the small island, and so grows up with a sense of growing displacement. At the age of 19, she receives a phone call from a woman who says that she's her maternal aunt, who tells her that her biological mother has died and invites her to Ghana to attend the funeral of her mother. And the novel charts Imani's journey to Ghana and her quest to answer questions about who she is and her place in the world. I'm going to read a small section from the novel um, at the point at which Imani receives that fateful phone call. The chapter is called 19. When a tree falls in a deserted forest, it causes an impact. The wind carries a murmur of this across land and water. Skirting over sea foam, it loses some of its resonance, but the vibration travels on. This trace, when it finally lands, is a shiver down your spine, a trickle between your nose and eyes that makes you sneeze or shed inexplicable tears. When my mother fell, I didn't hear it. I felt a shiver down my spine at around 2 p.m. on a Saturday at the end of October. I was 19 and hanging clothes out to dry in the courtyard. I dismissed it as a chill in the wind. Then, days later, I received the message. 
The phone rang in Reverend Mother's office. I let it ring, thinking someone else would pick it up. When no one did, I walked in and answered it, as I'd heard Mother and her sisters do so many times before. Hello, Sister Teresa's convent and day school. How may I help you? I need to talk with Imani, a woman said. My body trembled when she said my name. It's me, I answered. Imani, I'm your Aunt Grace from Ghana. Your mother is dead. No need for pleasantries to cushion the blow. We were family. My Aunt Grace from Ghana told me that my mother was pronounced dead on Saturday afternoon, just after 2 p.m. She had been unwell for some time. The funeral is in two weeks, Aunt Grace from Ghana told me. My aunt continued to talk, but I'd lost the ability to process information. She told me a number, an address, names and dates. My hand wrote it all down, but my mind didn't quite register any of it. I searched the room for Imani, frantically looking up and down. Then I saw her, crouched by the door on the opposite side of the room, head between her knees, rocking back and forth. Still holding the phone to my ear, I noticed that my writing hand had stopped. I was nodding in response to something that Aunt Grace from Ghana had said. She didn't hear me nodding and kept repeating the phrase. Finally, she said goodbye, and I put the phone in its cradle. When my mother fell, I didn't hear it, but I felt it. It took a while for the vibrations to be understood, but the shiver down my spine, the peal of the phone, and my Aunt Grace from Ghana saying my name, these were the gongs that announced a change in the weather. My next reading is from about a third of the way through the novel. Imani wakes up in Ghana after having just arrived. It's called Brown. Chickens cluck and gossip nearby. A car honks in the distance. Someone somewhere shouts a greeting. Wheels screech, several of them successively. I wait for the crash. It doesn't come. Voices rise in confused or angry chorus. A group of children chant a playground anthem. They clap and stamp in sync. I can't make out the words. The soft lap of a skipping rope beats the ground repeatedly. Something hits the window. A ball? I don't move to see. Soupy air rests on my skin and the sun through the blinds crosses my cheek with a lick of dry heat that is surprisingly refreshing. The crisp light soothes against the cloying humidity. I open my eyes and close them. Open, then close. The ball hits the window again. Close eyes, open, close. I do that thing where your eyes are open behind closed lids. I watch the light filter through the skin that shields my gaze. The back of my eyelids glow ochre, brown, and brown again. I'd always known that I was brown. I don't remember it being a discovery, putting my arm against Sister Alma and noticing the difference between us. Paddling on the beach with Reverend Mother and realizing the contrast in our reflections that they rippled in the stream. There was no one moment when I suddenly knew. Amory was blackish gray and mother was whitish pink. Amory was spirit and mother was flesh. I was brown, somewhere between them, more flesh than Amory and more spirit than mother. They were my coordinates and I knew where I was rooted between them. Black was different though. It came announced. It was the year the parish roof couldn't be repaired anymore. There had been so many patch jobs done. It was like an old quilt, all threadbare and no good at blocking water. That autumn, we had a Cayley to raise money for the new roof, and Mrs O'Shea from the village, Penelope Marie's mum. She told Sister Alma that I was a good dancer because all black people have rhythm. And there it was. Suddenly, I was black. After that, there was a world outside with others who were black like me, and this hunger formed. Perhaps it had always been there, as a cloud may be, but it hardened, became granite in the pit of me. Every time Harold found another morsel about black on Yahoo, I savoured it. But black also made me dizzy. Like when you're little and you spin around, then in the middle of spinning, you realise you can't stop and stand still, and you'll fall over if you try. Black came with expectations, a rhythm, and other things that might trip me up. At Heathrow, there were people of all colours and combinations. I saw a woman, brown like me, with hair the colour of a postbox. A boy, paler than Sister Alma, with black hair down to his knees, 
chains hanging from his wrists and blue and purple around his eyes. I watched them ravenously. I wished Amory was there to see it all. I prayed she stopped being so stubborn and appear. At Kotoka Airport, the faces were all kinds of brown. Chestnut, mahogany, oak, chocolate, terracotta, hazel, copper, gold, umber, rosewood, ebony, coffee, onyx, dusk. Many things drew me to this topic and I feel as though it was something that was with me and building over a number of years. Um, a key moment that I remember is when I was working in Northumberland as an arts development officer and my first day on the job I went to a primary school to observe an animation workshop that was going on and as I stood back to watch the final animations um, shared with the class a young boy came and stood next to me and took my hand and held it and he asked me why are you black and I thought it was a really interesting question and it felt very innocent and on the drive back from Northumberland to Newcastle, where I was living at the time, I kept thinking about that question. It really stayed with me. Um, I thought I was probably the first black person or person of color that he'd ever met. Um, I also found it intriguing that he asked me why I was black and not why I was brown. So he understood that the term for my race was black and not brown. Um, so he'd encountered ideas around race at some stage in his short life. Um, and I started wondering what might life be like for a young black girl growing in Northumberland who doesn't have a connection with a black community who knows nothing about black history. Um, and that idea formed and became more and more, I suppose, exaggerated because initially it was, what if there was just this one black family? But then I took it to an extreme and thought, okay, what if it's, there's just one black girl and she has no connection to um, people of African heritage at all? what would life in rural Northumberland be like for her? Um, I also think one of the things that was with me unconsciously perhaps in writing this was uh, a, young, a desire as a young reader to see a black character in nature, um, you know, running through fields, climbing trees, swimming, because as a young reader, I read lots of books which included children and groups of children who had nature as their playground and who felt very at home in the natural world. And I grew up in cities and always longed for the, um, the depiction of those lives that I'd read, but never saw anyone that looked like me in those stories. So I think there was that unconsciously with me as well. Many things inspire my writing, lots of things. So. Um, as small as a conversation, like the conversation that I had um, with that young boy in Northumberland all those years ago, uh, things I read, similarly um, to the things that influenced me as a young reader, that found their way in some way into my debut novel. Um, things that are happening in the world, things that I watch. The, yeah, the world, life, the life that we're living at the moment, all of these things ignite ideas for stories in me. Well, I'm terrible at talking about projects in development. I am working on a new novel. Um, the central relationship in it is a marriage and it explores questions about health and medicine and knowledge and culture, I suppose. Um, as I said, I'm very bad at describing it, but I'm hoping that it won't be too long until I'm finished when I should be much better at describing what the book is and what it's trying to do. Well, this is an easy one for me at the moment because I've just read a book that absolutely blew me away and it's Burnt Coat by Sarah Hall. It's a phenomenal, exquisite book that um, focuses on two lovers who meet and then there is a lockdown in their world and there is a pandemic, uh, similar to ours, but far, far worse. Um, and their relationship is accelerated through lockdown. And the novel is the story of um, Edith, the woman in the, in the couple looking back decades later on that moment, on what happened and on how life um, kind of evolved afterwards. Um, it's 
it's beautiful, it's poetic, it's it's gritty, it's real, it's tender. There's, yeah, there is so much um, heart and knowledge in this book. I would recommend it to everybody. Hi, I'm Lorraine Wilson, and I'm gonna give you a wee reading from my debut novel, This Is Our Undoing. Uh, the scene I'm going to read to you comes from fairly near the beginning, and it has two characters in it, Lena and Tiago, who are scientists based at a remote field research station in the Rila Mountains in Bulgaria. There has just been an unexplained power cut, so they've been checking the equipment. The family of Lena's murdered enemy have also just arrived at the station, and Lena's own family, who are in danger back in London, uh, she has been trying to get them to safety. Done, Tiago said, turning off the barn light, the unlit dark slipping a little closer. Yes, solar panels okay. Lena tipped her head back against the wall of the old house, watching there and gone stars between clouds. Down on the low ground, frogs were calling an alto note beneath crickets and the grass. Guess we'll find out tomorrow. Tiago leaned against the doorframe to her left, facing her but looking up at the new house, where one light remained on behind drawn curtains. Zander's, Lena thought. Oh, look what the boy gave me, she said, remembering, pulling a small figure from her pocket and handing it to Tiago. Kai had appeared silently beside her as she was checking the camera on the track and handed it to her without a word wandering back out into the dark grass before she could think to tell him to get inside, before she could remember that it was nothing to do with her, how Silene Wiley chose to parent her children. A Martinitsa, Tiago said slowly, tilting it into a sliver of light. It was a figure of a girl made from red and white wool, a simple thing quickly made. This one looked a little mournful, bedraggled by the months that she must have been hung out in the forest. Yes, it was strange that neither she nor Tiago had noticed it before, if Kai had found it in the meadow, but perhaps Eva had hung it there in the spring on one of the flowering bushes, the blackthorn or green gauges, where only a small boy's intent eyes would spot it. Still though, he's a little, she hesitated, Faye? Lost? Familiar? Tiago hung the Martinitsa from an edge of stone in the wall and gave a short, low laugh. The mother's worse. The frogs in their pond fell silent, frightened by a fox maybe, a deer, something seeking a drink or seeking them. Lena said carefully, you won't do anything, will you, to make them leave? Tiago's gaze shifted to her face his attention like a touch. Like what? Like, oh God, I don't know, T. She smiled at him, his strong face made subtle by the shadows. Like offend them, or look so fierce they fear for their lives. Those last few words hung in the air and she heard herself make a small sound at which Tiago jerked, then subsided against the wood again. Would it be so bad, he said. The frogs were still silent and Lena had no idea what to say. No, if she were th only thinking of herself, then no. But it was terrible enough fearing for her father and Jericho. She could not imagine what it had taken to make someone like Tiago hide away. And she couldn't see him lose his sanctuary too. Promise me, T, she said without answering. Don't give them reason to fear you. He was still watching her, studying her face as moths wove patterns through the light. I won't, he said quietly, then perhaps pointedly, where are they now? Lena closed her eyes. Outside London, she said. You'll keep them away from here? Isla's reassurance and Silene Wiley's strange hooded comments. Zander's pale fingers. I don't know, she said. 
Yes, the frogs began to call again, one, then another, summoning bravery. So this is, this is our undoing. It's my debut novel and it was released by Luna Press in August of this year. It's a speculative story based in a near future Europe that is fracturing under climate change and far right politics. It's quite genre blending. It's got a bit of dystopia, a bit of thriller. At its heart, there's a murder mystery. So it follows Lena, my main character, Lena, who fled a dangerous past in London to build a new life as a scientist at a remote field station in the Rila Mountains of Bulgaria. Um, when an old enemy dies that puts her family in danger and she must find a way to save them without becoming a monster. It's a story that's full of secrets and the wilderness. It's full of found family and danger and the fight to stay true to yourself when the world around you is full of darkness. I started developing the idea for this story around about the time of Brexit and Trump. Um, and there were climate disasters unfolding around the world and I had this overwhelming sense of powerlessness in the face of these global events and global politics. And the theme of this story kind of came from that, from my attempt to answer my own question about um, how much power we have as individuals and how much it matters which choices we make and those small decisions we make to stand up or to hold out against the tide. So it started as a story that was kind of an exploration of anger, but it ended up being, I think, a bit of a love letter to the Rila Mountains, um, to the nature, the wilderness, that type of, of um, ecosystem, and kind of a a love letter to found family as well and the power of being true to yourself to your heart when the world tries to tarnish you well nature is the quick answer to that i am a conservation scientist by training so the wilderness is present in everything i write and i love I love the power of nature as a setting and as a as a force within your story. So it, it's it's there all the time for me. I also love um, writing folklore and having folklore as a thread within my stories, whether it's at the foreground or in the background, because I think that mythology is the lens through which we view the natural world quite often. And I'm fascinated by what that reveals about us as individuals and as societies. Um, the other influence I think on my writing is my own heritage. I'm, I have uh, quite a rootless family history. So I'm drawn to questions of belonging and identity and the inheritance of trauma. And I think that those are quite universal themes and they're quite ephemeral they're, they're quite hard to pin down so I, I hope that writing about those kinds of things is something that will resonate with with readers and that's I think that's at the heart of what pushes a lot of writers to write is the the hope that you will connect with someone and make someone somewhere feel a little a little seen and a little less alone I am in the final stages of editing my second book, which is called The Way the Light Bends. And that is coming out in a year or so with Luna Press again. It's a very different book to This Is Our Undoing. It came where This Is Our Undoing kind of came from me looking out at the world with a sense of horror. Um, the Way the Light Bends came from the memory of being lost within myself and it's set in present day Scotland and it's full of Scottish folklore and revolves around two sisters who are grieving their, their brother. And they are both very lost and searching for a way back to each other and searching for a, a sense of belonging and a sense of home. So I'm really enjoying those edits and uh, but it'll be quite good to get them back to my publisher and then 
Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing that book come out into the world. So that's a really mean question to ask bookworms, right? Because we read so many and we kind of love quite a high proportion of them. But I think if I had to pin it down to one this year, it would be The Kingdoms by Natasha Pulley. And I love, I love the gentleness of it. It's such a, it's so profoundly human, the story. And it's, it's got this wonderful sense of uncertainty and um, the sea is threaded through it all, which I love. So is Scotland and Scottish landscapes. And I love the way that the past is interwoven with the future in the story, because I think that that's, that resonates as a, some, a real truth that it's not a different kingdom. It's not a different country. It's, it's still very much something that shapes our present. So yeah, I would highly recommend that as a, a very beautiful, profound book. So I think that's me. Thank you very much for having me uh, on Book Week Scotland and uh, get in touch if you enjoyed my book. Hello, my name is James Watson. I'm the Managing Director of Sparzile. I'm here today to introduce Adrian Keefe, who is one of Sparzile's debut authors. He's written his first book, Game Bird, which shines a light onto the twilight world of autism. It's the next day and Spencer's at work. He's very excited today due to the fact that he finally got his Lego model 7140, an X-Wing fighter, back from Norman Beasley, who borrowed it three years and 146 days ago. He's brought it in to show Diesel because she's a Trekkie. She knows how to say a few Klingon phrases, such as, your mother has a smooth forehead, and she likes Star Wars as well. She always arrives before him and he can barely contain himself as he goes into the warehouse. But she's not there and he has to wait. It's 1916 and she still hasn't come in and he's been outside three times to see if she's smoking a cigarette and he's asked every member of staff in the building, which is 11, and no one knows where she is. There's no way of finding out either and the office is shut. Not only is Spencer crestfallen, he doesn't know what to do because there's no replacement supervisor no other staff work in the warehouse, and he's not permitted to use the computer, which has all the information about what stock to put on the shelves, because the union said it's out with his jurisdiction. It's 1931, and having nothing else to do, he takes the Lego set out of its box and starts building the X-Wing fighter. And having built it so many times before, he doesn't need to refer to the instructions. It only takes seven minutes, and almost exactly as he finishes, a man walks in he doesn't recognise. Uh, excuse me, sir, uh, customers aren't permitted in here, Spencer says. I work in the warehouse at the superstore, the man says. I've just come from there to fill in for your man. And that's my chair I think you'll find. Oh, right. Spencer vacates it and stands there, shifting from foot to foot while the man sits down. Spencer tries to think of something to say. Uh, what's your name, please and thank you? My name? My name is Bill. And he looks down at the ground. Poster. Bill Poster. What's your name? Uh, Spencer Frederick Morton. Spencer, yes. Unfolding his newspaper, he starts to read it. I've heard about you. Haven't you got something to be getting on with? Uh, yes, but I don't know how to use the computer. Diesel does it all. She finds out what stock we need on the shelves, locates it for me, and I put it in the merchandising trolley. Is that right? Let's have a look. Bill folds up his newspaper neatly and turns the computer on. Is this yours? He holds up the spaceship. Uh, yes, it's Lego Model 7140. An X-Wing fighter. It's very rare, especially in good condition. 
with the box and instructions. I've had it since 1999, which is when it came out, and I was eight years old. Have you indeed? That's interesting. How much is it worth? I don't know, but it's not for sale anyway, because I'm an enthusiast. I've got 17 Lego Star Wars models, 29 Lego train models, and three Lego bus models. Have you indeed? That's interesting. Do you have any other rare ones? And not really. I should say the 7140 is the rarest. It's exceedingly rare, in fact, especially in good condition. And in the box, yes, you said. 7140, you say. Let me make a note of that. Are you a Lego Star Wars model enthusiast as well? Spencer's face lights up. Well, yes, yes, I am actually, but I haven't got a 7140. I've got most of the others, but not this one. What have you got? Spencer can't believe his luck at meeting a fellow enthusiast. What have I got? What haven't I got, you mean? Well, apart from the 7140, obviously. Have you got a Millennium Falcon? A Falcon? Have I got a Falcon? I've got six, all in mint condition and still in the boxes. Wow, Spencer's never heard the like. But look here, Bill turns to the computer. I can't get it to work, see? He's pressing keys and nothing's happening. Can't you log on? Not on this computer, no, it won't let me. So, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Let me have a think. He strokes his chin and his eyes revolve. At length, he stops stroking his chin, his eyes stop revolving, and he raises his eyebrows. I give up. He puts his feet up on the desk and unfolds the newspaper again. We'll need to go up and down all the aisles with a notebook and an HB pencil and write down all the things we're short of, then find them all, put them on the merchandising trolley and take them to the relevant shelves. The relevant shelves. Yes, I suppose you're right. Bill doesn't look up. I'll tell you what, you make a start and I'll join you later when I've finished reading my paper. How does that sound? Uh, that sounds good. Well, it's called Game Bird, and I had this idea of a man, it could have been anyone, who's walking along in life, or just living his life, and he's going in a certain direction, as we all do, and then suddenly he's, he's diverted. He's attracted to something, he just decides to go in a different direction. And it's that idea of um, changing direction. And then I, probably at the same time, or just afterwards, I had this idea of um, a bird being shot out of the sky, and a bird of, not a bird of prey, a, a game bird, and um, so like a pheasant just flying across the sky, minding its own business, and then suddenly its trajectory is altered by a bullet through the heart, and that was really the crux of the whole idea. Well, the main theme of the book is change, and I wanted to find a character who, who really brought about that theme. So I thought that the perfect vehicle to do this would be somebody with autism, because through them, I could show how someone is coming from a very narrow, limited world, and then it's the discovery of a world that is based on infinite possibility. Well, I think that I'm probably quite fortunate in that I have a lot of ideas all the time. That's my strong point. And especially when I'm cycling or on a train, I find that ideas just come to me. And I have an idea for a book or something or other, and I mull it over for a very long time and kindle it and sort of cherish it as it were and then gradually characters will form and then I'm up and away really and 
it's almost as if when I get to that stage that everything that happens to me in life, well not everything, but so many things that happen to me and things that I see, they just, they're all grist for the mill and they can go into the story. I'm working on another book which is also about change and it's all about this character called George who leads a perfectly cosy normal life but uh, from an outsider's point of view he's actually emotionally stunted and into his life comes an asylum seeker and although they only have a very brief time together that interaction actually has ramifications which affect the rest of George's life. Well, I'm actually reading a book at the moment which is also published by Sparsile and it's also about autism. But both these things are coincidences. So it's this book here which is Comics and Columbine by Tom Campbell. And I'll just read you a very short quote from it, which really expresses the nature of uh, autism for me. Um, so here we go. I had problems accepting anything which functioned independently of my will. My first memory of betrayal occurred upon discovering my mother had moved from the position I had left her in. I could not accept the monkeys being both singers and actors as this breached the unspoken law of singular function I assumed the universe to be based on. But because it's about autism, and my book is also about autism, and I found that because this book is autobiographical, it really um, puts you there. You really feel for this person who is, um, is struggling. And um, it's, just, it's just totally captivating.